Andrew will get started in just a minute. We're just going to wait for a few more people to hop on. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Carl Stone Cipher, who practices in Greensboro, North Carolina, and is a clinical associate professor of ophthalmology at the University of North Carolina. Dr. Stone Cipher has been recognized as one of America's top ophthalmologists due to his extensive experience with cataract and refractive surgery. He is a pioneer in the ophthalmic use of low-level light therapy technology in the United States. Dr. Stonecipher, I will now turn it over to you. So today, ocular surface disease, you know, does it really matter? And I think it does, and I think there's a lot of ways to promote that. And what we're going to do is tell you, I do have some disclosures. Probably the biggest ones are Nybeck and Evamad, Lumbar, and, and Marco. So why do we even treat dry eye? You know, when I grew up, uh, dealing with dry eyes in the mid 80s for the first time, I, you know, most people didn't really want those patients. And a lot of those patients referred out to other doctors because we didn't want to deal with them because really we didn't have a lot of options to treat those patients. And it's a huge number now, and it was a huge number then, and it's becoming more and more of a hot topic because we're using our mobile phones and our iPads and our screen time is much increased. And I tell the story, Bill Trattler and I were at a meeting recently and I was looking out over the pool and we're at the Debbie Hotel and he and I are having a beer sitting by the pool. And I said, Bill, I said, what's wrong with that picture? And he said, nothing's wrong with that picture. It's a beautiful day, everybody's by the pool. I said, no, no, what's wrong with that picture? And he said, I don't care, what's wrong with the picture? I said, look who's in the pool. And everybody that was in the pool was an adult. Everybody that was around the pool was a child or an adolescent, and they were all on their iPhones or their iPads. So I think this is only a problem that's going to increase. I think we now have plenty of options. And so dry eye today versus 20 years ago is completely different. Say one thing. I don't need to convince you, but I still go through it every single time. It's an inflammatory process. And we've got evidence of that inflammatory process. And we've got Michael Stern and Steve Flugfelder, and we wrote many of the papers. My first paper was in dry eye. Uh, which was published in 1986. And so I think that for the most part, we can say if we can quell the inflammation, then we're going to solve the problem. But now we have all these different ways to do it. So it's an inflammatory process and it's a chronic disease. So when you tell me it's a syndrome or I'm dysfunctional or whatever, and I was part of the paper that Cedars Aspen wrote, we argued and argued over dysfunctional tear syndrome. I really don't like the term syndrome. I was a person to say disease because I think it is a disease and I think we treat it like a disease and the patient considers the chronicity of the disease. So why do we even need this tear film? Well, we've got to see, so optical clarity and quality. So one of the biggest complaints that I see constantly after refractive, refractive cataract surgery, cataract surgery, you know, is I can't see. And I can look at them and say nine times out of 10, it's because you've had a response to the surgical intervention and you're a bit dry. And the ocular surface is not lubricative and not lubricating well. And so if we can do some things to make you more comfortable and lubricate it, I think you're gonna be okay. But more importantly is its antibacterial properties. And more importantly is what the tears do in terms of flushing out those particles, whether they be aller allergic like we have now here in the great state of North Carolina or whether they can be toxic. And so that pH balance, that protective, you know, growth factors and healing factors and those antioxidants are very important to how we heal after surgery. So there are a lot of components to the tear film. We've known this. Uh, Michael Stern and Steve Flugfelder have, have elucidated a lot of these uh, factors. And we've even found more since these slides were generated well over uh, 20 years ago. So I think that in dry eye, we lose a lot of these factors. And this affects the viscosity and the lubrication of the tear film. So when our ocular surface is altered, then we have poor viscosity. We have increased osmolarity. We have imbalance of these cytokines. And if we learned anything about this coronavirus is, is it's the cytokine storm that's killing the patients. So yeah, 82% of the patients will have a mild or moderate effect, but somewhere around 20% will have some sort of cytokine storm. And in three to 10%, depending on where you are, that can be fatal. So the cytokine storm in terms of uh, coronavirus or in terms of our ocular surface is important. And when we lose that ocular surface, it becomes damaged, the epithelial integrity goes away, and then we start getting squamous metaplasia or more skin-like 
changes, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Now, with everything, we've got to have an algorithm. We've got to have how severe it is and how do we look at it. And these are the ITF guidelines were published back in 2006, and we kind of looked at it as mild, moderate, severe, and really bad. And, and really the really bad ones you probably don't see in your practice. A lot of those go to the university. Um, they can be the severe Sjogren's. They can be the ocular circuit signatures with pemphigoids. It can be a lot of different things. Because in this day and age, it's extremely rare, and I have a pretty robust dry clinic, and I'll see filamentary keratitis, which is a level three. So most of our patients are ones and twos. So then they started getting goofy and we started talking about aqueous and evaporative and non sjogren and sjogren and then we got TFOS involved and, and, and we've got all different things. But what do our patients see? Well, they see this shelf of stuff and this stuff can be contact lens solutions. It can be tear products. Number one, look right there in the middle is Visine, okay? And I think that, you know, the, some of these things are harmful to some of our, our, our patients. Uh, they've been talked about their diet. They've been talked about systemic medications. They've been talked about over-the-counters. But one of the studies that we've shown is that an average patient, before they even walk into a doctor's office, will have done seven different things prior to seeing us. And we put this together for our, again, a long time ago. It's Bill Trapler, Eric Donenfeld, myself, uh, Mark Milne, a lot of different very smart people. And basically, we talked about the common symptoms of dry eye. And unfortunately, it cut out one here, which is fluctuation in vision. Sorry, my slide did that on us. So if it's gritty or, or stinging, it's probably more like my bumming gland disease. It's itchy. It's more like allergy. I don't really see dryness. But if people are saying it's blurred or my vision is fluctuating, then that's where I start thinking, okay, this is a dry eye process, and we got to figure out how to address that. Now, I always say, you know, where's the rainbow end? I love this. It uh, just so happened to get that one. It ends at the rainbow car wash, and the rainbow car wash is no longer there. It's now been replaced. Uh, but I think that, you know, I love scleral lenses in these severe patients. I love albumin. I'm not a big fan of autologous serum, only because it's so hard to make and so hard to get, and it's going to be harder to make and get, I think, as post COVID-19, and I, I don't think a lot of people are really using the oral cetagrogs, and, and I think that, so for the most part, I think that there are other things that we can do, okay, before we get to step four, uh, but I love amniotic membranes, and I, I encourage my optometrists to place amniotic membranes in their offices, and 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 they're, you know, waiting, I mean, they're they're like small uh, surgical areas or whatever you want to call it, diagnostic areas or or a, a clinical room that they can actually do this in. Putting those on at the slit length is challenging. Uh, I think that therm permanent punctual occlusion, I used to not do it that much, but I'm doing it more and more, but we obviously use silicone plugs prior to that. So anyway, um, the dues two came out. Oh, and that got even less confusing. So I was thinking, okay, great. Let's just put that out there too. And it's great for you know, a, a way in which to teach the residents or teach the students or, or actually kind of think about the process. I'm not against that. But when we're talking to our patients and we want to talk about this disease or this dysfunction or whatever you want to call it, we can just basically say either you don't have tears, you're losing tears, you've got a problem with your eyelid margins, or you don't blink really well. Or, you know, Ms. Johnson, you may just have a combination of all those. And let's kind of go through each one of those. You know, we don't talk about people with sleep apnea and wearing their devices at night. But their wife will tell you about it because the guy keeps her up all night with the device on. So I think there's a lot of different things that we need to go through. Now I want to spend a little time on this slide because this is something we all have. Okay, so if somebody looks at me and they say, Dr. Stone Suffer, I want to start a dry eye practice. How do I do that? I said, well, you can do that easily. You got everything you need. I don't like Shermer tests, so I put that at the top. But if for some reason I want to do a study and I have to prove that that entity is going to improve tear production, I better do Shermer tests. But if you've ever had a Shermer test done on you, first you sit there for five minutes and it is uncomfortable with a piece of paper in your eye. And, and nine times out of 10, it isn't answering the question that we're really asking, unless it's an aqueous deficient problem. So if I'm trying to prove that Zydra or Restasis or sequel or something's 
improving, increasing tear production, I've got to look at Schirmer tests. Now, there is one caveat to that, that I still do Schirmer tests, and that's in refractive surgery and refractive cataract surgery. I have to show that I can normalize their Schirmer test. I like that to be above 10. Uh, if somebody is still willing to have surgery and they're showing somewhere between, say, 7 and 10, uh, we'll talk about it, but I always, always, after an intervention, put a copy of the Shermer in my EMR, whether that's a photograph of it, it's either recorded, documented, or I actually put a strip of the Shermer market where they were before and after the intervention, whatever we did to them, so that legally I can say we had this discussion about dry eye disease, because they always forget that discussion. Now, you know, you never told me that I might have issues. Now, I had LASIK uh, years ago, right around 2000. Uh, I had bad dry eyes before. I had both of my lower puncta thermally cauterized prior to my uh, refractive surgery years before. And I'd been on restasis for a few years before I had my actual intervention. So I think that that restasis kind of had to come out for me to improve my my um Equus deficiency, and, and we ultimately had LASIK, and I live happily ever after. Now, I still had a dry eye after LASIK, and I had one before, but the thing that I tell you, with these new interventions that we're going to talk about today, I think it makes a huge difference. I, I rarely use tears, and I haven't used restasis for quite some time. Tear breakup time is easy. You and I both can do it. My staff actually does one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. My buddy Bill Trattler makes him use a stopwatch. I'm okay with that. Uh, we can look at the tear lake uh, now. Uh, we have devices that can look at the tear lake we're going to talk about. We can look at the function of the meibomian glands. We can look at the lid function. Uh, we can simply put a light source underneath the lid, have somebody close their eyelid and grade how much light sneaks through to see how much exposure they have. My friend Laura Perlman, Perlman just uh, uh, talked about that. Dyes, fluorescein, rose bean gal, lysamine green, whatever you want to say, just use it. Now, we don't use fluoresce because that has an anesthetic in it. And I think fluorescein was hard to find there right after the hurricane that hit Puerto Rico, but it's back. I love lysamine green. I'm not a big rose bean gal fan, uh, but I'm not opposed to it. And then we just have to ask the patient. Tifos. Years, all sorts of diagnostic methodology, but I don't think you have to have this to have an adequate dry eye clinic. Now, what are we missing for just a second? It just would be a miss if I didn't bring it up. And that's lid wiper epitheliopathy. And why do I put it here? Because it's keratinization of the eyelid margin. And I think that, you know, you can grade it, you can see it, but with fluorescein or with lysamine green, pick one. You're going to pick it up. And it's a different entity, but I think it also is related to the eyelid margins. I think it's also related to meibomian gland disease. And I think that sometimes we miss the fact of this biofilm tear layer on our ocular surface that's also on our lid margin surface that we may not be effectively treating with some of these topical pharmaceutical interventions. So let's go into treatments for just a second. You know, we want to normalize the tear film. Forget how, we just want to normalize the tear film as best we can. And we want to know what's the easiest way to do that. And there's a lot of different options. But like I told you, that replenishing the tears is probably already been done with seven different varietals before they get to you. Now, before they get to me, most of them have already been plugged. Most of them have already been on the antibiotic steroid. Most of them have already been on doxycycline. But a lot of times what I don't hear people talk about is lifestyle changes. And what I don't hear people talk about is their systemic medications. But what I do see is almost everybody's been treated with a steroid, cyclosporin, or lofidograce. And so by the time they get to me, I've got to come up with a different game plan. So nine times out of 10, I spend a lot of time on their lifestyle and see if diet may be entering into the picture and maybe omega-3s or changing their diet patterns, or there is a systemic medication. And I've had arguments with their cardiologist on many occasions saying, surely there's another antihypertensive in this whole world of antihypertensive. I just had this with my aunt. My aunt had no dry eye issues. We put in uh, two reading style premium channel lenses in her. She was seeing great. And the cardiologist said, uh, I'm going to put her on a systemic beta blocker. 
and it fixed her blood pressure. But you know what it did to her dry eyes? I mean, her dry eyes, it made them dry. And so she came back, she goes, Carl, I'm not seeing as well. Have you changed anything? Well, yeah, my cardiologist just put me on this blood pressure and lower medication. I called him up and I'm like, dude, surely there's something other that works. And he had the conversation with me of, no, you figure out your dry eye thing because it makes your blood pressure better. I'm like, really? Now my aunt was married to a cardiologist, so we were able to work through that process because she pushed the point, but I don't think that's gonna always be the case. Now, we want to treat the inflammation. So when I talk about goals of therapy and when I talk about, hey, Carl doesn't use his restasis anymore, Carl doesn't use Zydra, he doesn't have to use his steroids, um, you still may need to do that to get you to a point where the patient's back to normal. So don't think I'm saying anything bad about any of these pharmaceutical agents or these systemic options. I think they're all great options. I just would like to get to a point where maybe we can keep the patient on a maintenance treatment and allow them to have a normal life. So I like to keep things simple, okay? And for me, blepharitis, my bumming gland disease, dry eye disease, we're changing gears a little bit, anterior, posterior, all that sort of stuff, it may matter in terms of what I decide to do. Now, when this patient walks in, he did. He wanted cataract surgery because he had posterior subcapsular cataracts from his steroids that he had been using for his allergic uh, disease. So he'd been using Flonase, and I think Flonase can cause some issues with posterior subcapsular chronic use, and we've seen several of those patients. But I couldn't get a good reading on it because of his seborrheic blepharitis and his ocular rosacea. And we had to go through a variety of things that this device that I'm going to talk about in a moment obviously has the option to treat that as well. So when this person walks in, I don't want to do cataract surgery on them. I don't want to do LASIK on them. I got to do something to get that cesspool that's in their eye treated. And it's going to take multiple rounds of systemic and topical medications. It's going to take topical ointments. Uh, I still use Metrogel. I think it works well. You got to teach the patients not to get it in their eyes. The dermatologists are more prone to use some more of the more expensive agents. I think something simple that helps these people is an anti seborrheic shampoo. So simply, I just tell them, just wash. And I know I'm not supposed to do that in this COVID environment, but I have them wash around their face. And I have my eyes closed in the shower and I sit there for 60 seconds. And I just sit there. And I let that antibacterial, that anti seborrheic shampoo take effect. Now, I think they all have different components. So one month I'll tell them to use head and shoulders. The next month I may tell them to use tea gel, uh, Celsin Blue. I just tell them to work around. I tell them try not to use the generics. I don't think the generics work as well. So I think that one of the things that we have to really think about is the patient itself. And yes, I will try and incorporate the dermatologist, the internal medicine, the doc, but sometimes they're resilient and they're like, uh, you're not a real doctor, you're, you're an eye doctor. So that really doesn't count. And I hear that every day and it doesn't, I mean, I'm not essential now according to the CMS, so I, I've heard it all. Now, when I'm looking at the posterior blepharitis or what I call my bulimia gland disease, okay, we need normal mybum, and, and, and when we don't have normal mybum, it's lipases that are breaking up, and it's your eyelid margins blinking, just like you're making soap, and that's what you do. You're making soap on the eyes. And so if you look, you can see these bacterial lipases breaking down lipids to soaps. And in many of these patients, they will have a soapy, sudsy tear film, and that's why their number one complaint is my eyes burn, Doc. They really burn. I mean, just by the end of the day, they burn so bad, I don't even know. I can put tear after tear after tear in, and it just doesn't seem to make a big difference. And I say, yeah, that's because you're making soap. And so a lot of times, I subjectively look at the patients. I say, okay, Mr. Smith, if I'm going to fix one thing today, I know you've been to great doctors, and I, I know a lot of the doctors you've seen, and they're all awesome, but I'm a one-fix-it doctor. I got one thing that I can fix. They say, well, my vision is blurry. No, no, I don't want to know that. I want to know something, some sort of symptom that you're going to walk away. Does it itch? Does it pain? Does it hurt? Does it burn? Does it sting? Give me a, give me a diagnosis. And I think that that, that that symptom 
can lead me to a diagnosis. So I'm saying their symptoms give me a diagnosis. And I think evaporative disease is the same thing. I think that sometimes that can be exposure. And like I was saying, uh, Laura Perelman basically just puts an light with the lid closed below and you can use an eliminator if you want to and just looks and sees how much light actually leaks out it's a great way to look at exposure i mean if you have a lip of you too that can help you in terms of blink and some other things but i think that's important too now again i think we all know the pathophysiology so i'm not going to spend a lot of time on it That's part of the issue. And I think that there's all sorts of options, rice and salt, trying to get them through the mess of COVID 19 here. Everyone's got ah, food. I've done the right. My, my partner loves rice and sock. I've done rice and sock. I'm tired of rice and sock. Rice and sock is not working for me. So he's a big, you know, put some rice in an athletic sock, put it in the microwave, and use that as a, a, a heat. I think that we've gone beyond that now. And I think that's where we get to. Uh, expression and IPL and some of these other things. And I was a big adopter of IPL early on. Now, you're going to see the slide a couple of times. And I think that that the meibomian gland disease is simply put as normal when you express turbid oils. Looks kind of like uh, Wesson oil. Turbid oils and paste. Kind of looks like a dirty Wesson oil. Paste. Kind of looks like toothpaste. And then number four, I can't express it at all. And what I started was back in 19, oh, not 19, sorry, 2018, 2017, we got this device from Italy. We had been using Cyanosure's IPL, but this was a no-gel IPL. This is not available in the United States or Canada at this time. So if you tell me, it is going to be available with the devices that they're selling uh, now with the low-level light therapy. Uh, I think it'll be an additive device. I think it'll be something that you can add on later, but it is not currently available. Uh, we're using it in Europe. I'm using it uh, in the United States as well. But I just want to bring that up for completeness sake. I don't think buying an IPL only device, and if one of you guys out there owns one, I apologize. I just don't think it's a good sell. I don't think it's a good buy. I don't think it's the way to go because it's kind of a one trick pony. And I own one of those one trick ponies and have for quite some time. IPL makes me nervous for two reasons. IPL is not colorblind. So your African Americans, your Indians, your darkly pigmented individuals, you can depict them with IPL. And I like the fact that my dry eye clinic, I don't have to be there for it to function. And this is not my patient. This is another patient. And I have this picture from a physician who actually did this to the patient that the patient didn't have protective eyewear. Uh, the patient opened their eye to see what was going on and he fried uh, the stroma of their iris. And it takes one shot. Now, this is what I wanna spend about another five to 10 minutes talking about is low level light therapy. And everybody gets confused by this. And even the literature is a bit confusing. My good friend, Stephen Bell, uh, wrote a paper probably about four or five years ago, published in clinical ophthalmology on the, the way in which light or IPL works. And he included photobiomodulation as well. Photobiomodulation is different than intense pulsed light. They work by different mechanisms. I think we're finding that out. I'm not denigrating anything Steve's written or done. I just think we've now separated these technologies and that LLLT kind of works from the inside out and IPL works from the outside in. So this photobiomodulation technology is a metabolic enhancer. It stimulates the production of ATP and it emphasizes cell activity endogenously. And so what we wanted to do was look at these iLike, which is now called EPIC in the United States because the FDA changed the name. We did a great study. Uh, we took it to the FDA and we are still there. And for whatever reason, they're concerned to marry IPL and LLLT, despite excellent results in very, very, very challenging patients. So the first group of patients that I did roughly three years ago now, um, we published that series in addition to a series of four additional surgeons. So we brought it on board. We looked at your topography, your tomography, 
we looked at your tear breakup time, we looked at your OSDI, and we looked at your staining. And we basically showed that my bony and gland disease scores improved. So with that study, we basically showed we decreased their OSDIs, we increased their meibomian gland expressibility, and we increased their tear breakup times. And we had an enhancement rate of around 17%, which basically meant that of those patients that got treated, some of them had to come back, and of those patients that came back, on average, they got three treatments. Now, in the real world, I charge them every time they come back. But I can tell the patients that the overwhelming majority, okay, of you are going to have one treatment, and I don't know after a year, but it's a disease, so you're probably going to need more than one treatment, but you may go a year, you may go two years with this, but we charge $350 for this, and I think it's important because we kind of have a step in terms of how bad these patients are. So most of the patients that will see you are more mild than what will see me after seeing two or three or four doctors. But this is in clinical ophthalmology. If you will put Stone Cipher, IPL, LLLT, clinical ophthalmology, it'll pop right up and you will be able to get that article. Now, Equinox is a new kit on the block. I really like this new device because I'm going to go back to, because this device was a bit claustrophobic. And I said something to him. I said, I look a little bit like Freddy Krueger wearing the mask. So we came up with a different design that I think the patients love because it's not so confining to the face. And so they can breathe better. Uh, it doesn't have that claustrophobic feel. And again, this is technology that came out of NASA and it's been around for a while. So if anybody says, oh, is that new? Well, it's a new thought process, and basically we're using this LLLT, this low-level light therapy, to stimulate ATP generation and endogenously heat these glands and make them work. And so by putting this mask on for 15 to 20 minutes, it makes a huge difference. Now, the Italians aren't big expressors, and i got to tell you that, but I am. And I think immediately after the treatment, I think patients uh, do better with expression, and we looked at that. We looked at only getting light modulation versus light modulation versus expression, and the patients that got expression did much better immediately after the treatment. So this is a patient that's post-treatment, and we're in the home stretch. We just got a few more slides. You can see this patient's had punctal occlusion. That can be a problem. In people with meibomian gland disease, you want to quell the inflammation, quiet the eye before you plug them, because you're just going to have that soupy mix in there. But this person was a four, which basically means before the treatment with LLLT, I couldn't get anything out. This is immediately after it, and maybe there are three. I'm getting toothpaste out, but at least the gland is functioning. The patient will notice that. We just did these results on Sunday, so pardon the slide. But we wanted to look at the worst of the worst. Patients that are non-responsive, recalcitrant patients, patients that have done lipoflow many times, patients that have had other treatment modalities like ILOCs or people that have had tear sciences or other site sciences or other types of modalities that didn't fail. So what we did was we placed these masks on three times a week over a 48 hour period. So Monday, you got a mask and express. Wednesday, you got a mask express. Friday got a mask express, and we followed you up a month later. And people showed improvement. Now, remember, these are the dregs of my clinic, so you can only imagine how bad these people are. And this is with LLLT with expression, or the Equinox. Surgery, yes. I had a cataract surgery, and I don't have time to go through this whole um, um, process, but, but this is my mother-in-law who has Sjogren's disease, who can barely tolerate light, who, yes, I waited a little while, look how brudescent her cataract is. I wanted to make sure she was functionally challenged, and she could still drive, I'm not mean. Uh, but we pre-treated her with LLLT. I'm saying immediately the night before and the morning of, and I used viscoelastics in surgery, and now you'll be surprised with average treatments. Uh, we do this probably two or three times a year now with the LLLT as a maintenance, she's just using a plain tear. She's not on restasis, she can't take it, she can't take Zydra, she can't take Sequa, she can't take any of those because it burns. So for me, a happy patient means a happy life. 
I want to talk one other option with regards to treatment is chalasia. Again, if you put in chalasia and stone cipher, this will pop up. This is a little girl who had multiple treatments, one treatment of LLT, and that's what she looked like. This is a young lady who took this selfie. I took the picture with my cell phone on the top. She took the picture with her cell phone the next day, one treatment. So these really evaporate and recalcitrant chalasia are, I have not incised and drained a patient in a long time because we catch them so early now because the uh, referring docs just send them straight over. They send a picture, telemedicine, send them straight over. Now, right after, right before, a long time before, I think with contact lenses, you're going to be able to help someone become a better contact lens wearer. So I think perfect vision is going to involve this, whether it's cataract or refractive surgery because dry eye is an issue. Now, with that, I want to thank you. I want to leave some time uh, for questions. And then the last thing I want to do is put up there on the screen. This will be up for quite a while while we're answering some questions. And uh, whoever is doing that, if you want to kind of start unmiking and going through that process of looking at some of the questions, I think uh, uh, it's pretty amazing. We've had quite a few attendees. Uh, thank you for your attendance. Again, if we don't get to all the questions today at this particular time, Wayne and I are very good about making sure that information is delved out. And if anybody wants access to my slides or any of this information, I'm always willing to share.